Hello YouTube. Um, so we've looked at using truth trees for valid arguments in K. Uh, now we're going to have a look at uh, invalid arguments. Um, now uh, you may be familiar with uh, how to create counterexamples to arguments, but I'll just briefly discuss it to refresh your memory. Um, so, uh, so what is it for uh, an argument to be invalid? Um, well, a simple definition uh, of invalidity is that an argument is invalid uh, when it could be the case that all the premises be true while the conclusion is false. Obviously, if an argument is valid, then true premises should always result in a, in a true conclusion. And if an argument is invalid, then though the true premises could result in a false conclusion. Um, so a counterexample is simply an interpretation which makes the premises of an argument true uh, and its conclusion false. And this would show that the argument is invalid. Um, take this simple argument, if p then q, q therefore p, which is of course the uh, fallacy of affirming the antecedent. Um, we can easily find an interpretation which makes both premises true but the conclusion false. For example, let's say we uh, say that p is false and that q is true. Well, on that interpretation, the first premise here is true because there's a there's a true consequent. Remember, if the if the consequent of a conditional is true, the conditional is always true no matter what the value of the antecedent. Um, the second premise is just true by stipulation. We're assigning q true, and then the conclusion is also uh, false by stipulation because we've just said that p is false. So this is a very simple counterexample to this argument. Um, what the, the, on this interpretation, the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So this is a counterexample to that argument. Um, that just shows the argument is invalid. Now, of course, most our arguments aren't as simple as this. Uh, you know, you might end up having a beast like this. You know, what do you do there? Uh, and when you see something like that, well, it's time to break out the truth trees. Uh, truth trees are just really a mechanical method for finding counterexamples. Um, and if you don't know that, then check out the videos I did on truth trees in propositional logic. Okay, so all, all of this stuff that I've said is also true with regard to the system K. We use truth trees to search for counterexamples. Uh, if the whole tree ends up being closed, then that obviously means that the argument is valid, uh, that it has no counterexample. But if the tree is open, we can easily see a counterexample uh, uh, on it. So consider this, this argument. It's an argument with no premises. Uh, if possibly p, then necessarily possibly p. Let's uh, let's do it. So we draw our world and we assume the negation of of our of our argument. Um, this is a false conditional, so that means we have a true antecedent and a false consequent. Well, now what can we do here? Well, we can open up a new world with uh, possibly p, in which we derive p. Uh, nothing more we can we can do there um, and then we have this not necessarily uh, which again we can open up into a new world with not possibly p and you can convert that into necessarily not p if you like but uh, but that's all that's that's all that can be done here um, remember remember that possibly and not necessarily you have to open up a new world each time you use them um, so we have here that's that's it that's all that can be done um, and our tree is open and that means that the argument is invalid so how do we check this I mean this this tree suggests that this argument is invalid but how do we actually make sure that this is the case how do we act, how can we be how can we confirm that the argument is valid well, it's invalid, sorry. Well, we need a, a counterexample, and we can quite easily see a counterexample in this tree. Um, since this argument has no premises, all we need to do is uh, create a, a counterexample that makes the, this conclusion false. So, um, remember that we are in system K here. Um, propositional variables 
are true or false within particular worlds. Nothing is true or false simpliciter. So P will be true or false in world 1, true or false in world 2, and so on. So uh, our counterexample for this formula will have to include worlds. And what we do essentially is just minimize the truth tree. Firstly, we draw our worlds and the relations between them as they are in the tree. So we can see here we've got WO, it accesses W1, and it accesses W2. Um, and now we need to assign propositional variables to each world. Um, the, the basic idea is just look at your tree, and if a propositional variable occurs in a world, you put the uh, you put it in the corresponding world in your counterexample. If the negation of a propositional variable occurs in a world, or if neither the variable nor its negation occurs, then we put the negation in the corresponding world. So from this argument, we can see that the only variable is p, uh, and we see that in WO, neither p nor not p occurs. So we can put not p in our counterexample. Um, in W1 we have P, and in W2, uh, again, neither P, uh, P nor not P, so not P in the counterexample. So does this counterexample actually work? Well, we can see that possibly P is true, because P is in world 1, uh, P is in W1, and W1 is accessible from WO, so possibly P is true, so that part of our conditional is true. What about necessarily possibly P? Well, remember, something is necessarily true in a world, uh, just in case it's true in all accessible worlds. So is possibly P true in all accessible worlds? Well, no. It um, doesn't appear in uh, W1 or W2. Or w In fact, in, in W2, you can see that its, its negation, its contradictory, appears. So that gives us... that means that... Uh, necessarily possibly P is not true in WO. And that, that gives us a true antecedent and a false consequent. So our conditional is false and this counterexample works perfectly. And we can translate it into more formal logical terms. Um, we say we have our model WRA. Uh, w is the set of worlds WO, W1, W2. Um, we can see that W1 is accessible from WO and W2 is accessible from WO. No other relations are shown. Um, and then the assignment function of well, the uh, value of P at WO is 0, value of P at W1 is 1, value of P at W2 is 0. So there we go. Um, pretty simple to see that. Let's take a look at another argument. If necessarily P, then necessarily if, if necessarily P, then necessarily Q, then necessarily if P, then Q. Um, right, well, assume it's negation. So we have a false uh, condition, <coughs> false conditional, due antecedent, false consequent. Um, now, we could open a new world with this, not necessarily, but uh, remember, it's a good idea to apply all the propositional rules first. So let's branch this this let's branch this conditional here um, which gives us either not necessarily P or necessarily Q and um, I'm going to focus on the right branch we can use this not necessarily if P then Q to open up a new world in which we can derive not if P then Q this is a false conditional so we can derive P and not Q um, but from this uh, necessarily Q, we can derive Q in, in W1, which contradicts not Q and the world closes, the whole branch closes. Right then, so let's focus on on the left branch. Um, we open up a new world with not necessarily a P then Q. Uh, again, we have P and not Q, uh, and that's all we can do in, in that particular world. Uh, there's nothing else we can put in there, no more rules to apply. We have to use this not necessarily P to open up yet another world where we derive not P. But again, that's all. There's nothing more we can do there. There are no more rules to apply on this, on this branch. So our tree remains open, uh, and that means our argument is invalid. 
And creating a counterexample is easy enough here. Um, the right branch with, uh, with W1 is closed, so we can ignore that. Um, we just focus on the part that's the branch that's open. Um, right then, so we have in our counterexample what we, we draw the worlds as they relate. Remember, we don't need W1 because that branch is closed, so we have WO which relates to W2, WO which relates to W3. Um, we can see that in WO there's uh, you know, neither P nor Q nor the negation of either appears. So in our counterexample we put not P and not Q. In W2 we have P and not Q, so we just transfer them to W2. In W3 we have not P and uh, neither Q nor not Q appears, so we have not P and not Q in our uh, counterexample. And let's make sure that this works. Well, uh, necessarily P here is clearly false in WO because P isn't doesn't appear in all the worlds accessible from WO. So clearly um, we have to have not necessarily P in WO. Um, now the this then is means that this antecedent of this conditional, this first conditional is false, which means the whole conditional is false. The, uh, means the whole conditional is true rather because uh, a false antecedent always makes the conditional true so that that part that first part of our of our larger conditional that first part there is true what about the uh, consequent um, necessarily if p then q well um, oh sorry I'm just that bit there just refers to the fact that this conditional is true in that world so now let's focus on the consequent necessarily if p then q well for necessarily if p then q to be true if p then q must be true in all worlds accessible from w o uh, but look at uh, w2 here we have p and we have not q which means that if p then q must be false um, and this means that necessarily if p then q must be false at w o Okay, so then, there, there, therefore, we have here a true antecedent and yet a false consequent, which means this formula as a whole, this conditional as a whole, is false. So the formula as a whole is uh, is false. So on that interpretation, we can clearly see that this counterexample, uh, this counterexample works. Um, so there we have it. Uh, our formula is clearly invalid. Um, now, um, it's worth bearing in mind that sometimes a tree might provide more than one counterexample. So you might find that, that you have more than one open branch. Uh, let's say, for example, that we didn't derive a contradiction here. I mean, if you imagine that was, I don't know, necessarily not Q, then we wouldn't have derived a contradiction here, and we would have had two open branches. Um, well, in that case, you just, you just pick one of the branches. Um, so if both of these are open, you can just ignore either one. Um, when you generate a counterexample, you start from one of the tips of the tree and then work upwards, uh, and, and then you just disregard everything else on, on the other uh, sides. So uh, thanks for watching that. I hope it was informative, and we'll uh, have a look at some more of this stuff later. Goodbye.